Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, first, a housekeeping note. This meeting is being recorded, and it will be available on our website. Um, I'm Sophia Hossein. I'm the Zero Waste Manager for DPW's Zero Solid Waste. I lead the Office of Waste Diversion, and we are super happy that you could join us all virtually for our first public review meeting on our 10-year solid waste management plan. We have a few folks here from the Bureau of Solid Waste joining us tonight. Um, we have myself, um, as well as some other folks from the Office of Waste Diversion, Megan Resler, Kara and Kalia up on camera to say hi, so you know who we are. Um, and we also have many partners as we are updating this plan. Um, so we are leading this revision with help from the Bureau of Water and Wastewater, with help from the Office of Sustainability, the Department of Health, Housing and Planning, and more. We're also working with collaborators from Geosyntec, uh, the Northeast Maryland Waste Disposal Authority, and Gavin, who are helping us track and incorporate input from stakeholders across the city as we update this plan in accordance with regulations set by the Maryland Department of the Environment. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to Faith Ezell at Geosyntec, who will get us started with the agenda. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Sophia, and welcome, everyone. So just to kick off, um, first and foremost, we will talk a little bit about WebEx functionality and the instructions for our testimonial portion of the meeting today. Then we will move on to background and purpose of the plan. We will then move on to talk about the current waste infrastructure and programs in Baltimore City, followed by a discussion of opportunities, which are highlighted in the plan. We will then move on to talking about resources and community input for the plan. And finally, we will have um, a testimonial portion of the meeting. So to discuss a little bit about WebEx and how it works, this meeting is being recorded. Um, the recording will be made publicly available on DPW's webpage for the plan. So please take note of that. If you need live transcription services, they are available by clicking the CC button, which should appear on the left um, hand of your screen on the bottom. Please check your device's audio settings if you're unable to hear audio at this time. If you are still having some issues, please use the chat feature for additional help. At the end of the presentation, attendees will have the opportunity to provide a two minute oral testimony. If you would like to submit this testimony um, using the chat feature, please feel free to do so. We will provide further instructions on how to provide testimony at the end of the presentation. Please note that we will not be responding to questions or comments that will be taken during this meeting. This will allow us to receive the maximum amount of feedback from participants. DPW will be posting common question themes and questions on the webpage in the following days. All written and oral testimony received during this meeting will be considered for incorporation into the next iteration of the plan. Please also note when giving testimony and using the chat feature to please be respectful of all attendees and panelists. So a little bit of background and purpose about the plan. So what is the solid waste management plan? This is a plan that describes the state of Baltimore City's solid waste infrastructure and programs. It also discusses strategies to enhance these programs and infrastructure within the 10 year planning period. This, the plan is regulatory driven, therefore the content and format is um, following the set of guidelines that are outlined by Maryland regulations and will be submitted to the Maryland Department of the Environment at the conclusion of the draft phase. The plan consists of five different sections. The first section is an overview of goals, the city's structure and regulatory guidelines. The second includes background information on population, zoning requirements, and federal facilities information. The third includes an overview of the existing system within the city. The fourth is an assessment of needs and constraints of the system. 
And the fifth is a plan of action during the 10 year planning period. So where are we getting the information to inform this plan? This comes from population estimates, historical data, tenant reports, and regulatory guidelines, as well as other city documents, including but not limited to the Less Waste Better Baltimore plan, the Sustainability Plan, the Zero Waste Plan, and the Climate Action Plan, just to name a few. One of very important sources of information is the public input. The public input is crucial, and we would love to hear your feedback and request your feedback on your priorities and goals regarding solid waste structure and programs within the city. We will provide further information at the end of the presentation on how you can provide this feedback. So you will note that this meeting is called the 60% review meeting. This plan development um, is broken down into four different stages. Currently, we are at the 60% draft phase, which means that sections one through four have been completed. You will note that the posted draft only has an outline version of section five, which will be completed in the subsequent draft and has a public meeting, which is the meeting today associated with it. Feedback received as part of the 60% draft phase will be considered for incorporation into the 90% draft, which includes a completed draft section of one through five and also has a public meeting associated with it. The 99% draft will also consider feedback received during the 90% draft period and will have a public meeting associated with it as well. The 100% draft will be completed with feedback from the 99% draft considered. This draft phase will have two public meetings associated with it. Following this draft phase, it, the plan will be sent um, for state approval and adoption by Baltimore City Council. Now, just to highlight the public meetings that we have, the first three are virtual meetings Registration is open for all meetings, so please head to DPW's webpage. The link is listed below the table to register for the following two meetings. The last two meetings have a virtual and an in-person component, so please feel free to check the webpage and updates will be provided once a time and location is determined for those meetings. They will have an option for in person as well as an option to join virtually. In addition to public meetings, we have a few other key events to make you aware of. The first is the planning commission meeting, which will occur in April. That meeting will also be public. Information regarding this meeting will also be displayed on our website once the information has been posted. In May, the draft will be submitted to the state. And in August, we expect that the draft will be approved by the state. Following that, in December, it will be submitted to the mayor and city council for formal adoption. Following formal adoption, the plan will go into effect in January of next year. So now I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Sean O'Donnell, who is our technical lead for Geocentech to give an overview of the current waste infrastructure and programs within Baltimore City. Thanks a lot, Faith. Um, so just to start off, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, the existing waste system in the city. Um, so <coughs> Faith, could you go to the next slide? Perfect. Uh, so uh, this is an overview of the existing waste flow and the existing waste streams in the city. Um, so starting on the left-hand side, the, the figure can be a little confusing, uh, so we're going to walk through it. So starting on the left-hand side um, are the two main uh, waste generators in the city. So uh, this is the first way that waste is sort of categorized. So residential waste is produced by city residents and it's managed by the public sector or by the city, whereas commercial waste uh, is generated by businesses and institutions in the city uh, and is managed predominantly by the private sector. Um, so looking at residential waste, uh, it can go to uh, one of five places. Uh, so, first, all, first off, it can be composted. Uh, there is a small amount of residential waste that is sent to community compost facilities or gardens, 
or to uh, residence drop-off centers and, and farmers markets where it is composted. Um, residential waste can also be sent to residence drop-off centers. Uh, that includes both uh, waste and recyclable material. Uh, it can also be sent from curbside collection. Uh, curbside collected trash and recyclables are sent to Northwest Transfer Station, uh, from which they are either disposed or uh, sent to <coughs> a materials recovery facility uh, outside of the city for recycling. Um, residential waste can also go to the wind waste facility, which is the uh, waste to energy facility in the city, uh, or to Quarantine Road Landfill, which is the uh, city operated landfill also in the city. Uh, looking at commercial waste, uh, it can also go to one of five places. So a lot of commercial waste is recycled. Is recycled. Uh, so there is a, uh, uh, there are quite a few waste processing facilities uh, in the city that, that process recyclables um, by, managed by the private sector. Uh, a, a, a small portion of uh, commercial waste is also composted. Um, that includes both food waste and yard waste, um, which is sent to various out of city facilities, uh, including composting facilities and, and anaerobic digesters. Uh, a large amount of commercial waste in the city is sent to the wind waste facility for incineration. Uh, a small amount goes to quarantine road landfill, predominantly from small haulers. And then another large amount of uh, commercial waste is actually sent out of the city uh, for disposal, and that's predominantly construction and demolition debris. Um, focusing now on uh, the recycled and disposed waste streams uh, from the wind waste facility, uh, ash from that facility is sent to Quarantine Road Landfill for disposal, um, whereas uh, back end scrap, which is um, metals recovered after incineration, are recycled. Uh, and then looking at the, uh, the types of recycled waste in the city, they include predominantly construction and demolition debris, which includes things like concrete or lumber or asphalt from construction or demolition projects in the city um, that are reused or recycled, uh, clean soil, uh, metals, including both you know, metal cans or scrap metal uh, that is reused and recycled, uh, paper and cardboard, uh, plastic containers, glass, and a few other materials such as tires. Uh, looking at what's landfilled in the city at Quarantine Road Landfill, uh, there's a, a large chunk of that material is beneficial use soil. That's soil that is reused uh, and used as a daily cover or intermediate cover at the landfill. Uh, a large portion, again, is also waste to energy ash that comes from the wind waste facility. And then also looking at the disposed waste stream, uh, based on waste composition analyses that have been done, there's a large amount of food waste and yard waste uh, that is disposed, uh, plastic, paper and cardboard, metals, glass, and other material. Uh, looking at composted materials in the city, uh, these include sewage sludge, which is sent to a variety of, of facilities in the city and converted to uh, <coughs> fertilizer or compost, uh, yard waste, food scraps, and a few other organic materials like compostable paper. Uh, next slide. All right, um, so on this slide, we're highlighting the existing solid waste uh, management facilities in the city. Um, so as you can see on here, uh, there are five full service residence drop off centers. Those are shown in black. Um, <clears throat> one at Quarantine Road Landfill in Hawkins Point, uh, one at Reedbird Avenue, uh, Bowley's Lane, Sisson Street, and then one co located with the Northwest Transfer Station. There are also three uh, locations that accept recyclables only from residents. Uh, at York Road, Calverton Road, and Lewin Avenue. Uh, Camp Small operates in the northwest portion of the city. Uh, <clears throat> this is operated by the Department of Recreation and Parks to process wood waste. Uh, this facility uh, recycles that waste to sell crime logs, wood rounds, and mulch to residents or uh, entities in the city. Uh, Quarantine Road Landfill is shown in red. Uh, this is a, a landfill operated by the city, which accepts waste from both residents and small commercial haulers. Uh, wind waste is shown in gray, uh, located next to I-95. It's a private facility that accepts waste from both the residential and commercial sector. Um, and then finally, uh, the materials recovery facility uh, shown in blue outside of the city, uh, which is currently Waste Management Recycle America, uh, that accepts single stream recyclables collected uh, curbside and at residence drop-offs uh, for recycling. Okay, uh, next slide. All right, just to highlight a few of the existing recycling and diversion efforts in the city. Uh, so currently, uh, some source reduction and diversion initiatives, uh, including the polystyrene and plastic bag bans that went into effect in the last few years. Um, these were used; these were meant to uh, limit the use of single-use items like plastic bags and polystyrene takeout containers. 
Um, and the reason for this is a to reduce the amount of waste that's generated and disposed in the city. Uh, and also because these materials are very hard to manage at recycling facilities. Uh, there's also the recycling can program, which was uh, initiated in 2021. Uh, through which free 65 gallon lidded recycling carts were distributed to over 190,000 city households for curbside collection of recyclables. Um, there are recycling initiatives in city schools, including education and outreach uh, initiatives, as well as um, things like the Eco Warriors program, which is a competition among city schools for recycling. Uh, and then finally, outreach events and social media, which include uh, the Recycle Right webpage, uh, which gives guidance to residents for recycling and promotes source reduction. Uh, and as well as uh, the city operates <clears throat> uh, five social media accounts, including Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Nextdoor, and Twitter, through which they distribute news and educational materials. Um, other highlights of the existing recycling and diversion program include the curbside single stream recycling program. Uh, through this program, uh, the city offers biweekly curbside collection of single stream recyclables. Uh, materials accepted in this program include uh, aluminum and steel cans, cardboard, uh, paper, glass containers, plastic bottles and jars, um, <clears throat> those types of things. Uh, the city also operates a few organics diversion and composting programs. Uh, these include public education programs promoting grass cycling and at-home composting, uh, as well as food scrap uh, collection programs uh, at farmers markets and resident shop off centers. Uh, and that material is sent uh, for composting. On the next slide, next slide. All right, so the, uh, the next few slides are here to demonstrate how uh, recycling rates are calculated in the city and how the state measures recycling. So on this slide, uh, we're looking at what we're calling MRA and non-MRA waste. So MRA stands for Maryland Recycling Act. So it's materials that the state counts towards uh, its recycling rates that it reports. Um, and so you can see uh, the materials that are counted as MRA waste uh, include <clears throat> what you might think of as curbside trash or recycling materials uh, like paper, plastic, um, metals, glass, and uh, food and yard waste. Um, what the state does not count towards uh, when it measures the recycling rate in the city uh, includes other materials that are disposed, uh, such as construction and demolition debris, which includes concrete, structural lumber, drywall, and asphalt, uh, soil, um, scrap metal, such as automobiles, uh, sewage sludge, and basically anything else that's disposed in the city. And uh, one of the things that, that <clears throat> we want to highlight here is uh, how the, the recycling rates are measured. So if you see in the, uh, the third column here that shows the orange, blue, and, and, and green bars, um, you can see that the city is uh, recycling, which is shown in, in blue, and uh, diverting organics, which is shown in green, uh, <clears throat> uh, significantly less MRA waste than, than non-MRA waste. So there is a lot of recycling that's occurring in the city that's just not counted by, by the state. Uh, next slide. All right, um, so this slide shows uh, the MRA recycling rate, so the state reported recycling rates with time uh, for the city, and also shows composition of MRA recyclables with time. Uh, so the MRA rate is shown with the black line uh, and is indicated on the right axis. Um, just note here that the state requires a minimum recycling rate of 35% for the city, uh, and the city has not achieved that in the past 10 years. However, um, there are some trends that I'd like to point out here. Uh, so, first off, there's that big drop in MRA rate between 2012 and 2013. Um, that is really just an artifact of how the state measures recycling. So, prior to 2013, they counted, um, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, uh, MSW ash uh, from wind waste that was used as, as a cover material at the Quarantine Road landfill as a recycled material. But beginning in 2013, they no longer counted that. That's why that gray bar decreases significantly. But uh, one of the uh, promising trends that we did see is uh, looking from 2013 to 2018, we did see a significant increase uh, in the MRA recycling rate. Um, and with a, a, a small decrease in 2019 and a larger decrease in 2020, that could be attributed to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, due to the pandemic, the, the city had to reduce service, uh, for example, moving to biweekly instead of weekly recycling collection, which we think has really uh, you know, uh, negatively impacted the city's recycling rate. Uh, so, although state data is not available for 2021 and 2022, we do expect that the MRA rate will, will pick up in those years and follow more of the trend that we see from 2013 to 2018. Okay, uh, next slide. Alright, and then this, this final slide in this section is to highlight the long term solid waste goals of the city. <clears throat> 
So um, in the uh, third column here, we're showing the current diversion rates for the city from, in, from 2020 uh, for various types of materials, including food waste, yard waste, recyclables, construction and demolition debris, bulk and special waste, um, and then other waste. And then in the final two columns, we include the city's long-term goals, which are laid out uh, in some of the city's planning documents, including uh, the Baltimore Food Waste Recovery Strategy, for example, for food waste, that's where those goals come from, uh, the Baltimore Sustainability Plan, uh, and then the Less Waste, Better Baltimore Plan. Um, so shown in color in the third column, uh, red um, diversion rates are, are basically areas where the city has not yet attained their long-term goals, whereas green rates are, are, are areas where the city has attained their goals. Um, so it's not necessarily a negative thing that the city has not attained these goals. Um, it's, these are long-term goals meant to be achieved over the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, so what I want to highlight here is the opportunities for the city uh, shown here. So particularly in organics, um, the city's current uh, diversion rates are um, uh, considerably below their goals. So that's a, definitely a place where there's a significant opportunity. And then also for uh, traditional recyclables, uh, you see the same thing. So uh, that's kind of the segue to the next section, which we'll talk about the various opportunities uh, that the city has to uh, improve their solid waste system. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so the first, uh, the first focus here is going to be opportunities to improve waste and recycling collection. Um, so looking at recycling collection first, uh, there is an opportunity for the city to update their existing equipment, per, uh, perhaps by uh, purchasing new vehicles. Uh, there's also an opportunity uh, for the city to recruit additional workers to reduce some of those staffing shortages that were experienced due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we think that, uh, <clears throat> you know, through updating their equipment and also uh, recruiting additional workers, the city also has the opportunity to reinstate weekly collection. Um, so as, as I stated previously, re uh, recycling collection was uh, changed from weekly to biweekly due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and uh, one opportunity for the city to improve or to uh, switch back to weekly collection and hopefully uh, improve diversion rates that way. Uh, there's also an opportunity for the city to improve residence drop-off centers, uh, either by <clears throat> improving access to additional citizens uh, or by uh, increasing the, the amount of materials that can be recycled from those facilities. Uh, and then also an, uh, an opportunity for the city to improve education and outreach, uh, mostly by changing behaviors and habits to promote recycling or diversion. Uh, looking at trash collection in the city, uh, some of the some similar opportunities here include uh, updating equipment by perhaps purchasing new vehicles, uh, also recruiting additional workers to relieve some of those staffing shortages. Uh, there's also opportunities to support waste reduction initiatives. So uh, by uh, reducing the amount of waste that's generated, uh, the city can uh, provide more efficient and um, <clears throat> effective uh, trash collection. And then there's also opportunities for improving education and outreach. Uh, for example, by uh, informing citizens about best practices regarding uh, bagging their waste and also what materials are recyclable versus uh, what materials are trash so that the uh, materials get sorted into the right bins. And then third um, <clears throat> opportunity I'd like to highlight here is for litter and illegal dumping. Um, so litter and illegal dumping is a, a, uh, is a, a potential problem in the city. Uh, but so this, it also represents an opportunity for improvement. So. Um, we think, first of all, by improving cleanup response time, uh, that's a potential opportunity for the city to remove some of that, of that um, urban blight. Um, there's also an opportunity for the city to engage local community members uh, to change habits and reduce litter and improve reporting of illegal dumping. Uh, there is a segue into the next one, which is an opportunity to improve reporting, first of all, by working with local community members, uh, and then also by working with uh, um, other city entities to improve enforcement of existing illegal dumping and littering laws. And then finally, uh, there's an opportunity for the city to support vulnerable communities. Uh, so illegal dumping and litter are most prevalent in low income and vulnerable communities. So uh, by engaging with and, and focusing on these communities, uh, it represents an opportunity to, for the city to improve equity with respect to uh, litter and illegal dumping. Uh, next slide. All right, um, <clears throat> the second area that we highlighted uh, as, a, as an opportunity for the city is to improve organics diversion. Uh, so this is split into three different opportunities. So the first is uh, reducing food wastage. Uh, so we see one potential opportunity here for the city to uh, consult the Baltimore Food Waste and Recovery Strategy, uh, which has lots of different ideas and opportunities for the city to reduce food wastage. Uh, there's also an opportunity here to improve education and outreach. 
uh, through community engagement, uh, trying to change habits and behaviors and to reduce food wastage and encourage food donation. And then also an opportunity for the city to support state mandates banning food waste disposal. Uh, so as many of you may be aware, there, the state of Maryland uh, recently enacted uh, a mandate banning uh, food waste disposal from large commercial generators. Uh, so the, the city intends to continue to support state mandates of that kind to uh, continue to try to uh, tighten the screws on commercial generators and, and improve commercial diversion of food waste. Um, <clears throat> so a second opportunity here is increasing organics diversion efforts. Uh, so some potential opportunities that were identified in the plan include uh, encouraging backyard and community composting. Um, also, uh, initiating pilot programs for organics collection. Uh, so those might include, you know, expanding upon the existing programs at residents drop off centers and, and farmers markets, uh, but perhaps looking at uh, schools or uh, city uh, government offices or or even a curbside collection program for residents. And then also uh, opportunities to improve education and outreach, um, <clears throat> mostly through uh, changing behaviors to encourage people to start source separating organics, either to send to backyard compost uh, or for curbside collection. And then finally, the third opportunity identified here is encouraging construction of in city composting. Uh, so right now, uh, there are no in city organics uh, processing facilities. Uh, so by working with the private and public sector, uh, the city has the opportunity to encourage development of an in city composting facility, which would really facilitate uh, organics diversion. Uh, next slide. All right, and then finally, uh, we have opportunities to improve waste disposal and transfer. Uh, so looking first at waste disposal, uh, there's an opportunity to expand the quarantine road landfill. Uh, the city's currently in the permitting process uh, on that. Uh, expanding the landfill would increase the service life of the facility uh, into the mid 2030s. Uh, so that's a, a definitely an opportunity to uh, increase the amount of waste disposal capacity at the city's uh, disposal, I suppose. Um, there's also uh, an opportunity to improve landfill operations, uh, mostly looking at technology improvements at the landfill to reduce lines, uh, also opportunities to uh, hire additional staff or uh, procure additional equipment to improve operations and the efficiency of, landf of the landfill. Um, <clears throat> also looking at improving waste diversion efforts, uh, which were highlighted in the previous slides, but uh, improving waste diversion efforts also has the benefit of uh, extending the service life of the landfill, which would be very beneficial for the city. Uh, also of note here is that the wind waste, the current, the city's current contract with wind waste uh, ends in 2031. And uh, other than quarantine road landfill and wind waste, there are no additional in city uh, waste disposal options. Uh, looking at waste transfer capacity, um, we identified an opportunity here to improve uh, Northwest transfer station operations, uh, similar to quarantine road landfill through various technology improvements or by hiring additional staff or procuring additional equipment. Um, <clears throat> the uh, operations of the transfer station could be improved. Uh, however, there is no room to expand Northwest Transfer Station. Um, and it is also worth noting here that Northwest Transfer Station is located in the Northwest portion of the city. It does not have the capacity to serve the entire city. Um, and it really is intended to, to really only service the Northwest portion of the city. So uh, that gets to the third opportunity here, which is to construct uh, additional transfer capacity, uh, likely in the Eastern portion of the city to service that area. Uh, and constructing additional transfer capacity would have uh, two benefits. First of all, <clears throat> it would improve the uh, efficiency of, of waste collection in the city by allowing you know uh, waste collection vehicles to consolidate their loads uh, at the transfer station, but it would also have the added benefit of uh, improving flexibility for the city. So uh, if, if with two transfer stations, uh, <clears throat> the city would have the opportunity to potentially send waste uh, for out of city disposal uh, more easily. Uh, than they do now, uh, which, you know, um, with the fact that, that quarantine road landfill is set to, um, you know, only has limited capacity, that's that's a potential um, opportunity for the city to uh, improve its flexibility and its resilience to the, in the future for waste disposal. Uh, next slide. And then finally, I just wanted to highlight the fact that this is a plan in progress. So um, all these, this assessment, the, the, the things that have been um, presented here, are uh, you know subject to public input and public comment, and uh, all comments gathered from the public will be used to uh, improve and and develop this plan further. All right, and with that, I'm going to turn it back to Faith. Thank you, Sean. So now we are going to talk a little bit about resources and community input. 
So once again, just as a reminder, there are additional public meetings associated with the development of this plan. The two remaining ones for March are open for registration. Please visit DPW's webpage to re register for these meetings. The final two meetings will have an in-person and a virtual option for attendance. Once the location and time has been determined, it will be posted on the DPW webpage. So please make note of that. There are also other avenues you can use to submit your feedback. So please visit um, the webpage by scanning the QR code or visiting um, the webpage listed below to submit your comments directly on the on the draft itself. We also have um, a email address that you can use to post your comments or your questions. So please feel free to email the the uh, email address that's posted. If you would like to provide written feedback, there's also an address you can use to provide that feedback. And feedback, regardless of the avenue you choose to use, whether that's testimony during one of our meetings, via email, mail, and those posted on the draft will be considered for incorporation in the subsequent, subsequent draft. And finally, just as a reminder, if you have general questions regarding city services or other non plan related question, please dial 311 to reach a city operator for assistance. If you require additional support related to current city services, please contact the community liaison for your district located in the table to your right. Now we will move on to the testimonial portion of the meeting. As a reminder, this is a publicly recorded meeting. If you decide to provide a verbal testimony, your first name and the first initial of your last name will be made public. Otherwise, the attendee list of this meeting will not be made public. If you choose to provide a verbal testimony, please raise your hand using the hand icon located at the bottom of your screen. You will be put in the order that the request is received. We will give you a notification when there is one person in front of you. When it is your turn, you will be prompted to unmute yourself. Please note you will be noted, uh, you will be limited to a 2 minute time limit. We will give you a 10 second warning when you are 10 seconds out from 2 minutes and you will also receive a 10 second grace period. If you exceed the 2 minutes. After which you will be muted. If you are dialed in with us today on a phone, please press star 3 to raise your hand. And we will notify you using the first 6 digits of your call and number. You will also receive a prompt to unmute yourself when it is your turn to speak using the star 6 button on your device. If you would like pr to provide written testimony at this time, please locate the chat box, which is on the lower part of your screen. Note that you are limited to a thousand characters, so you may need to submit multiple messages to capture your full testimony. And as a reminder, please be respectful to all meeting attendees in the chat and during your oral testimony. No responses will be provided at this time to allow for the maximum amount of feedback to be received. And the meeting recording as well as slides will be posted to the DPW web page listed at the bottom of the screen. And the web page will also include frequently asked questions and comment themes in the following days, which will capture comments and feedback that has been um, provided during this meeting. So that is to come. So now I will pass it on to Gavin to facilitate the testimonial portion of the meeting. Thank you, Faith. So at this time, if you would like to give an oral testimony, you can do so by, as Faith explained, raising your hand. We are monitoring the attendee list. So in the order that hands are raised, we will unmute those individuals and begin the testimony portion.
Jennifer Kunze, I am requesting to unmute you. And your two minute testimony begins now. Am I up? Can you hear me? Yes. Sweet. Thanks. Yes. My name is Jennifer Kunze. I uh, live in East Baltimore in McElderry Park and I work for Clean Water Action. And thanks everybody who's been working on this plan. I'll just run through a couple of specific points and I'll also be submitting testimony uh, uh, written as well. Um, so with the time span that this plan covers over the next 10 years, it's really, really important that the plan really specifically commit the city to not renewing the Bresco contract in 2031. There are some hints of that. There's some discussion of that in the plan language as it stands, but uh, chapter five, as it's being developed, needs to commit the city very specifically to not renewing that contract that would fulfill specific promises by Mayor Scott. And it's really necessary um, to over the next eight years get to that point and use this plan as a tactical tool um, setting up the things that we need in order to not renew this breast contract with Bresco. So chapter five should also flesh out and really go into detail on how the city is going to build out the mini MRFs that are discussed in the plan, uh, the recycling infrastructure that's discussed in the plan, building off of what's in the capital budget, right, proposed in the capital budget right now, so that we are diverting um, uh, such a significant amount of waste in 2031 that there will be no pressure to renew the Bresco contract. Um, one other slightly more persnickety note I'll mention, there's some discussion in the draft plan of um, a percentage point credit on the city's recycling rate, um, being able to be credited to, credited to the city by using the trash incinerator. Um, that's outdated. Um, in 2021, the legislature passed HB 280 which uh, removed that credit for um, recycling, uh, towards the recycling rate for using an incinerator. So I'd like to see that language updated. And if there's calculations on the recycling rate based on including that percentage point credit, that needs to be updated. Um, Thank you. Jennifer. Those are my that major your... points. Yep. Uh, and quick question, is there a deadline by which uh, written testimony on this would be the most helpful? A deadline for submission. Um, yes. As soon as it is uh, given, it will be considered for subsequent drafts. Got it. All thank right, you. Thank John. you very much. At this time, if there are additional testimonies, please raise your hand. You will be unmuted, asked to unmute in the order of which you raise your hand. Greg Saltel, you have raised your hand next. I'm going to request to unmute you. You are unmuted, Greg. I'm yep. going to start the timer when you begin. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, <clears throat> question at the beginning, the interactive planning document that's been sent out, um, residents who are commenting on that, that's equivalent to providing testimony that will be considered in the additional drafts that are being worked on, correct? Yes. yes. Great, okay, just making sure, because there's a lot of energy being put into making sure that there's people putting comments into that document. I just wanna make sure that putting it in the chat or talking now aren't the only ways for the input to be considered. No, there has been input prior to tonight's um, draft meeting, so that has been taken into consideration through those common avenues. And then going forward, um, anything that comes out of today's meeting or into those common avenues going forward will be considered for the subsequent meetings. Great. And then is there going to be a, I know this is mostly a comment, but is there, also, is there going to be a final tabulation of all the comments received that's available to, 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 to see in one organized fashion, given that there's many methods, many ways you can send it in, you can say it verbally, you can write it on the document, you can write it in the chat. Is it all gonna be consolidated at any point where the public can see it? I will send that question to DPW. Um, I believe at this time we are not 
answering questions. Um, so we appreciate that, you know, observation and that will be. Um, I'll, okay, I, I'll say it as a comment. I would really appreciate it. And I think <laughs> I would to, to be able to see all the great ideas and input that are coming forward and all the many avenues that have been made available to, to people. Um, okay. Uh, I have so, another comment. There's about 40 seconds. Okay. <laughs> it's a lot of process. Okay. Um, I, my comment is, this is a, a significant opportunity to go from uh, reactive to problems like legal dumping and limited infrastructure to being proactive. Um, the solutions have come over the past decade from communities and to boil them down, it amounts to making historic investment in new infrastructure for composting, reuse and recycling guided by a framework that ensures good jobs, community, uh, if not ownership, community oversight of any new infrastructure to ensure the buy-in and longevity of new infrastructure being built and that we never repeat the mistakes of the past where we have unaccountable disposal oriented infrastructure and that we use this as an opportunity to be proactive and to put forward new solutions to moving towards zero waste. Um, I think this is particularly pronounced in the illegal dumping section, which was uh, detailed a bit tonight, which is that I heard a lot of reactive um, statements made and, and, and ideas and not much that gets at the root of communities like Curtis Bay, where I'm the co-president of the community association are dealing with a lot of legal dumping because we have a lot of vacants and a lot of vacant properties. We don't want that to be the long-term future. We feel like in order to address illegal dumping, we need to get at root solutions, which deal with community economic development. We don't thank accept you, the cur just one thing. Thank you. We don't I'm sorry. It, I, it's a two minutes. If you would like to continue that thought in the chat, we will do that for the subsequent right. steps. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. At this time in the attendees list, Dave Arndt, you are next. Monica, you are after Dave Arndt. So, Dave, I am going to request to unmute you. Dave, you're unmuted. You have two minutes and it begins when you do. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I really uh, agree with uh, what Jennifer put forward. I think we really need to uh, focus on a real plan for closing the incinerator. This really is a health issue that causes asthma, cancer, and heart disease. And the city is spending millions of dollars in healthcare expenses and lost wages here. Plus there's a lot of social injustice done uh, contributing and it's a contributing factor to violence and inequity and we really need to have a plan that uh, doesn't look at 2031 as a date but we should be really having a plan to say let's put a stake in the ground and uh, go with what Mayor Scott really did on his campaign promises and let's say let's close this at the end of 20, 2025 and let's put a plan in place to be doing that. Uh, second, uh, we really need to have uh, more measurable goals in our plan. Uh, so uh, things like uh, we need to re remove, reduce the amount of material going into solid waste by a particular volume. Uh, for example, let's say by the end of 2024, that is 15%, the end of 2025, it's 30% and, and so on. So let's put some really stakes in the ground of how we're reducing the amount of stuff that's going into landfill and into our, our waste stream. And we also need to really be looking the same thing as uh, uh, compost material and let's put a stake in the ground and say that by the end of uh, 2025, 50% uh, of all compostable materials are going to a compost facility. Uh, thank you for this time. Thank you, Dave. I was gonna say you have 15 seconds. Okay, I'm done. Great. Thank you. I am going to mute you. Uh, Monica, your hand is raised next. Um, Monica, are you on? Monica, I do not have the ability to unmute you. Um, please check that your audio is connected. I'm going to lower your hand for now, but if you could please check that your audio is there on the platform uh, WebEx.
Okay, Monica, thank you. I have sent you a request to unmute. Good evening. Hi. My name is Monica, and um, I um, live in um, Cold Spring, Newtown. I'm new to the city. Um, I just have um, concerns about trash collection. Uh, with, you know, living here, I've, I've experienced two weeks without trash collection. I've, I've called 311 and told them the situation, and the resources seem very, you know, they would like the city doesn't have enough resources to collect trash. So that's a, I think a huge problem. I'm, I'm, I see that composting is a, a huge priority in the plan. Um, I think it would be really great if we had composting containers. I think education is really important. I think people need to get feedback on where all this waste is going. And if we are doing recycling, how is it being recycled? Because I think that's a motivating thing for people. We don't, it's like a closed loop. It's like we're putting in, but we're not getting anything out. Um, so I think those are things that I'm most concerned about. Um, living in the city, I noticed that there's a lack of receptacles for like hand trash around bus stations. I also noticed that there's some disparity in, in trash. Like if I drive a couple blocks, I would say west, I I notice, you know, a, a significant difference in, in this, the cleanliness of the streets. So I think that is a huge problem as well. Um, and uh, I think that's really all I have to say, um, thank you. Thank you have 15 you. seconds. That's good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. Mark Costello, your hand is raised. I'm sending a request to unmute. You are unmuted, Mark. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Mark Costello and basically I'd like to echo everything that's already been said so far, uh, starting with what Jennifer stated that um, there needs to be actionable steps in plans to close the uh, Bresco incinerator. So we should work that into the plan. Uh, and I think just along those lines come up with actionable metrics as was already noted when it comes to um, diverting waste or reducing waste, put some percentages in there with some years. Um, just because looking at a couple of those charts, they seem like, uh, especially the recycling that was taken in, it's easy to, um, you know, say that that was COVID, but what are we doing to, to turn that around and divert more waste from uh, the landfills and put it into recycling? And uh, I do think education around composting resources available is a huge thing. I live in an apartment in Hamden, uh, and I do take my compost to a private facility because uh, I will take it to farmers markets when they're happening, but uh, just knowing where to do that in the community would be very helpful. Um, and then also, I was walking around Druid Hill Park today with my dog and there's the uh, dual trash can, maybe recycling receptacles, but they always have the same amount of trash in them. Um, so just kind of make those more user friendly, whether that's creating a different size opening for bottles, cans, paper, um, but it's just kind of one giant bin that most people seem to miss the trash can anyway, um, but just kind of making it more user-friendly and take some of the guesswork out of it would be great. And I uh, appreciate the information here. It was very well organized and that's all I have. Thank you, Mark. At this time, there are no hands raised in the queue. So if you would like to raise your hand, please do so. Shoshanda, I'm requesting to unmute you. You are unmuted. Hello? Yes. Oh, hi. I'm um, sorry. I'm just driving. 
um, I'm pulling over, but um, I hope everyone is well. Um, I just wanted to say um, that um, we really need the the plan to really commit to a lot of like what residents have been doing in the city is looking at um, some of the things of where our race goes, like the Bresco incinerator, which is the number one air polluter in Baltimore, which, um, you know, we have been doing a lot of work to like divert that waste that's going there. Um, so we don't have to rely on the incinerator or on landfilling um, that we can develop new infrastructure, such as compost infrastructure, which someone was just talking about, um, just having access to composting and being able to be being able to um, do that. Um, I think that once we do that, then we can um, really start to move away from those um, things that we see. Um, so we really need to have like that being like something that's really phased out through this plan. Um, so um, it's clearly stated, um, and so residents know what the city is working forward to. You have one minute left if you have anything else. No, that was all. Thank you. Thank you. Valerie, your hand is next. Beyond Valerie, there are no hands raised in the queue. Valerie, I'm going to request to unmute you now, and you'll have two minutes when you begin. Valerie, you're unmuted. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Valerie Passion, um, and I just wanted to comment and add to the aspect that somebody before raised about community economic development um, and not focusing on the waste management plan as if it is the only things that residents of Baltimore City are faced with. Um, programs like the Be More Beautiful program place the burden on residents and neighbors that already have many other pressures on their time and their energy and their resources. So I would like to see in future iterations of the plan a very specific outline of how how the burden can be shared, but really actually made equitable in making sure that whoever is in charge of outreach and education is not the same people that are already overburdened with the problems that come from poor waste management plans. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. To raise your hand, if you have dialed in, you would press star three. Right now, there are no raised hands in the queue. Toby, your hand is raised. I'm requesting to unmute you. Toby, you're unmuted, and when you begin, your time will begin. Two minutes. Awesome. Thanks, Sophia. Hope everyone's doing well tonight. Appreciate the opportunity to uh share feedback tonight i uh, agree with um statements that jennifer and others have taken about kind of the specific it the plan will hint back and forth about whether or not old bresco will be closed but just to kind of strongly support that action and lay out a little bit more of the follow-through plans i think there's been a lot of conversation about composting and the plan talks between composting and anaerobic digestion i just think it would be valuable if we have some analysis potential benefits of compost over AD and um, what type of facilities would be most appropriate and beneficial going forward. Um, uh, I appreciate, again, the kind of focus and discussion tonight around community efforts. I know you included the Violetville compost station and thinking about support or other avenues to amp up local composting where there aren't those drop-off centers. I do think those are going to be expanded to more options, which is great to hear. Um, but just again, appreciating that emphasis on community ground up efforts um, while also acknowledging some of the larger threats. If there's um, some misinformation between larger scale or anaerobic, anaerobic digestion or composting or even chemical recycling, that was kind of mentioned at the end. And finally, um, again, just going back to the community efforts that have um, been driving efforts in Baltimore for the last 15 plus years, I think. Uh, there's some mentions of United Workers in the plan that should potentially just be scrapped, and you can reference uh, the community members that really did, uh, drove the development of Baltimore's uh, Fair Development Plan for Zero Waste. But thanks again 
uh, for the time. I hope everyone takes care. Thank you, Toby. At this time, there are no raised hands in the queue. If you would like to raise your hand for testimony, you can do so by hitting the raised hand icon or star three. For my city, you have the next raised hand. Andy Hins, you are after that. For my city, I'm un requesting to unmute you. You'll have two minutes once you accept the unmute request and you are unmuted. Yes, hi. Um, I'd like to see more. So we're a nonprofit in Baltimore City. I would like to see more collaboration with nonprofits in the food waste space. Um, my not, our nonprofit is the largest compost uh, facility in the city right now. Um, and it seems like a lot of people don't on this call don't even know about us. So um, we offer free composting for every city resident. So and we even pick it up at your home. We, we need to see more um, uh, exposure between or more connectivity between the city and nonprofits doing this work currently right now in the space. There need to be more exposure so that residents are aware of what's being done in the local community. So, um, like I said, our organization offers free compost pickup to every single resident right now in Baltimore City. And you can drop off a comp your compost at our facility. Our facilities take meat and everything. Um, and then, like I said, you can even pick up the compost and use it in your gardens for completely free. So, um, you know, that's something that I see kind of missing in this plan. And I think we need to. To highlight that a little bit more on the plan going forward is more collaboration between. Nonprofits and the city that especially in the food waste space, because there's a lot of us in that space right now doing work for the city. That's all I have. Thank you. Andy Hins, you are next in the queue. Christopher Irvin, you are after Andy. Andy, I'm sending a request to unmute you. You are unmuted when you. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Yes. Um, hello. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, I would like to see us um, prioritize um, closing the incinerator as soon as practical above all other considerations in the plan. And, and I think that's, you know, out of respect to the community members of ours that are ha have to breathe the uh, pollution from from there. So I, I think that really needs to be our highest priority. And just one other thing I'd like to say is I would really like for the Office of Sustainability to testify in support of the Reclaim Renewable Energy Act, uh, which is um, in both the House and Senate this session, and it would end uh, um, so-called clean energy subsidies for um, for uh, municipal uh, waste incinerators um, that ratepayers are paying right now. Um, so I think the city really needs to support that bill and let Annapolis know that we're serious about reducing harm in our city. Thanks very much for the time, and thank you for this presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you, Andy. Christopher Irvin, I am sending a request to unmute you. You are unmuted. Your time will begin when you do. Um, thank you for taking my comments. Um, I, I definitely support the comments of Jennifer Kunze. And I, what I would like to offer is a little different um, in that I would like for us to be mindful of our language around the issue. I think that we addressed um, waste as a problem instead of addressing it as a solution. Um, when, we, when we understand that what we can currently consider waste is largely made up of um, items that are still traded on the NASDAQ, that waste is a commodity for the most part. I think if we begin to um, use the language that addresses it in that fashion, we won't simply see it as something to burn up or throw away, but instead something that could be used to actually as revenue for Baltimore City. We currently do not take that approach while many even local surrounding areas do. So I would just again reiterate that we um, be mindful of our language in addressing solutions. And I think that we would see uh, waste or, or, or refuse 
uh, more as a commodity than as a problem. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, there are no raised hands in the queue. If you would like to raise your hand, if you are calling in, you can do so by pressing star three. On your screen, there is a raised hand icon. No raised hand in the queue right now. At this time, I'll just give a little reminder um, that you can submit feedback throughout this planning period in a various number of ways. If you visit the web page, which is listed at the bottom of the slide that's visible, um, there is an email address as well as a mailing address that you can provide feedback as well as posting directly on the posted draft, which is also on the linked on the web page. So there are also other avenues that you can use um, to provide your testimony. Thank you, Faith. If any attendees would like to give an oral testimony, just raise your hand. Monitoring, there are still no raised hands at this time. Johnny Martin, I have requested to unmute you. You are unmuted, you may begin. We are in our presentation or discussion, but I just wanted to lift up um, the including you know a lot more youth workforce development and community led um you know efforts uh around solid waste and if um again if i've missed that earlier in the presentation i apologize thank you There are no additional raised hands in the next couple of minutes. Uh, we will be ending tonight's meeting. We are happy to allow for additional testimony. So if you would like to have yours recorded, please do so by raising your hand. If you're on a mobile device, you can press star three. Ann Wilson, I am requesting to unmute you. Ann, you're unmuted. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to give feedback. I just want to add my voice to those who have called for um, the quickest possible closure of the Bresco incinerator. Um, I, I, you know, there's not that many people who can come out and, and be at a DPW hearing on a Wednesday night at uh, 6.30. And it appears to me that everyone who has actually taken an interest in this hearing 
and has been able to set aside the time and prioritize it has shown that um, the the incinerator is extremely unpopular and I know that the city is in a tough spot um, with figuring out next steps, but there really needs to be a top priority given to shutting down that incinerator. And I, and I think the fact that pretty much everyone who has testified tonight is saying the same thing, um, I, I trust that will be heard loud and clear, not only by DPW, by city, but by city leadership, including our mayor who did promise to um, shut down the incinerator. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Anne. There are no raised hands at this time. If anyone additional would like to give testimony, please raise your hand. A reminder, if you are a call-in user, you can press star three to raise your hand. Just as another reminder, we will have other public meetings associated with the draft development. I will show the schedule of public meetings just one last time. Please, once again, uh, look at our DPW's webpage um, to register for these events. Um, as stated before, the final two meetings will have a virtual and an in person option. And once the location as well as the time is determined, um, it will be posted on the web page. In the following days, we will also have a frequent questions and common themes that we've noticed during this meeting, as well as comments and feedback received through our other avenues. So please check the web page um, in the following days to see an update that is inclusive of feedback received during this meeting. And once again, if you would like to provide feedback outside of this meeting, please um, use the following ways listed on the screen, whether that's through email, if you would like to send a letter, um, or if you would like to post it directly on the draft, please visit DPW's webpage. Feedback received during all of these avenues will be considered for incorporation in the next iteration of the solid waste management plan. So um, if anyone would like to provide um, testimony at this time, please feel free or verbal testimony at this time. Feel free to raise your hand or hit star 6 if you're dialing in with us this evening. Or excuse me, star 3 dialing in with us this evening. There are no raised hands in the queue. Johnny Martin, your hand is raised. Johnny, I believe you already gave testimony. If you would like to do additional testimony, you can submit it written in the chat.
It looks like um, no one is raising their hand to provide testimony. Um, I think that means that it's okay to wrap things up just a little bit early. But I just want to give everyone um, one last chance to um, raise your hand if you would like to provide testimony. Okay. Well, I just want to thank everyone um, for attending our first public meeting, for your interest and engagement in the plan, and for providing your comments. Um, like we said, um, all of your comments will be thoughtfully reviewed um, and we will post the common themes for comments and priorities on our, um, on our solid waste management plan website. So, um, with that, um, I'm going to end this meeting. If no one else has any more comments or testimonial and if any comments come up. As during this planning process, um, you will have multiple avenues to submit them and also can attend our meetings going forward. Thank you so much. And this concludes our first 60% draft um, public meeting. Thanks. Great meeting, y'all. Good night.